The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IA exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMD's Alpha Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This episode is proudly brought to you by NetWealth. For over 21 years, NetWealth has provided market-leading technology, excellent customer support, and expertise to help wealth businesses thrive. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important to embrace new technology to enhance the way you run your business. With change comes your chance to use advanced technology, reshape your client experience, and see wealth differently. Visit the website to learn how NetWealth can support your advice and wealth business. Hello, and welcome to the XY Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter diamond Tennis, and joining me here today to deep dive into the Iris suite of tools is a hackathon judge and an Adelaide Crows fan. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Matt Mensforth. woo Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thanks for the opportunity to chat today. Not at all. And now I'm really keen to ask all sorts of questions about Iris I mean, we could probably be here for hours and hours and hours. There's so much there, isn't there? <laughs> there um, is, but yes. <laughs> yeah, before we dive in, let's just get to know you a little bit as a user of technology. What is your most used emoji? Do you use emojis? Uh, I do, and the okay. the most my most used emoji is a pretty boring one. It's thumbs up, but it's it's just so versatile. I, I use it all the time. I, I use it in messages in Slack for work. I use it in WhatsApp everywhere. It's my my go to. That means it means yes. It means good. It it's just an all round versatile emoji, and I use it all the time. I'm sure people are, are sick of seeing it as a standard response to many things. <laughs> it's awesome, and I love that it's sort of particularly Australian. You know, it's my, yes. you know, like it's got a, it's got a bit of Aussie thing to it too, which I love. Yeah. Now, in terms of our smartphones, we all live with them all the time. If you had to wipe everything off your smartphone and just keep three apps, what would be the three you'd keep? Uh, the the three I would keep. Um, I, I think first up, I'd say photos, um, mm. just for all the memories. It's just great. It's great having all of them available in your phone all the time. So I'd, I'd definitely keep those. Um, for something more boring, banking apps uh, or finance type apps. It, it's the you know if you think back to how we used to interact with with bank accounts and banking. 15, 20 years ago, it's so different. It's so, yeah. so much easier, so much, you know, efficiencies. It's, you know, easy to keep, keep track of things. So I'd, I'd say those. And then, um, I think find my is, is another important one to me. Um, with a, a 12 year old daughter and a 15 year old son, it's, it's reassuring to know that I could, I can check where they are. Um, awesome. I probably would have okay. hated it when I was young, but, um, <laughs> yeah. it's really, it's, I like having those. Um, yeah. and then does Safari count? Cause oh, that's four, but I, yeah, keeping a browser, I, I, you get access to so many things on your phone. Don't you? Know, you? Crosswords and, and, and Wordle all those and questions. All exactly. And all those questions you have in a moment, you'd love to know the answer to. You know, we don't have to wonder anymore. Yeah. We can just find out instantly, <laughs> yeah, uh, which definitely. I love. Awesome. Okay. Well, let's dive into all things Iris and Xplant, shall we? So basically, I sort of approach these discussions as me as an advisor and owning my own practice, like, hey, I want to know more, um, which is a bit selfish, I guess. But it's fabulous. They're letting me <laughs> host this pod so that I can do my own advice tech digging. Um I'd be truly stunned if the listeners haven't heard of Iris and Xplan. Um, they'd have to be living under a rock, to be quite, <laughs> to be quite frank. Particularly, um, you're a dominant player here in Australia, and I know all over the world, um, you guys have a you play hard in the advice tech 
sort of space. But in the interest of completeness, um, you know, on the off chance somebody doesn't know, what is the category that, you know, X plan in particular, I guess, but, you know, Iris sort of plays in in the advice tech world? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we, we build sort of a quite a broad range of technology that connects and powers different parts of the financial services industry across advice, trading and market data, superannuation, and even even mortgages in, in some markets. So yeah, okay. if we look at X-Plan, X-Plan first, um, it's you know one of our core offerings. And as you said, you know, many listeners will be familiar with X-Plan and what we do. We've got over 100,000 users globally. Okay. Um, and X-Plan is our sort of our comprehensive financial planning and wealth management software for, for advice businesses of any size, really. So from the smallest one one person business right through to some of the really large enterprise clients with several thousand um, several thousand users. So yeah, uh, it's centered around a purchase a purpose built um, financial advice CRM, and then we've got supporting modules that link to that that help you in delivering advice with you know, modules like X Tools, Wealth Solver, and Risk Research that help you sort of come up with your um, strategy and product recommendations, um, investment management administration with our portfolio module that's sort of supported and powered by IrisNet data fees that cover sort of yep. broad um, part of the industry sort of um, for platform and insurance data feeds. Um, revenue management with the Compay module. We've got client portals. There's integration capabilities and, and data insights modules. So a full range of, of modules and there that, that support <laughs> most things you need to do in an advice business. And then if we look sort of really briefly at some of the the near adjacent areas of of, of what we do um, and some of the things that people might not be as as aware of, I think there's the the managed funds administration business where we're yep. the largest outsource provider of, of unit registry services. Okay. And we, we administer over seven hundred billion um, in in funds on the Ooh. on the registry now here here Just in a Australia. Little bit. <laughs> yeah, and in the the superannuation space, we've been that's that's sort of a few more years in, in that area there, but sort of provide software and services as well to more than 50 funds here in Australia. Okay. There's over 380 billions of uh, dollars of funds under management on, on the, the, the system there and over 4 million member accounts. So th- th- those areas, so the managed funds administration, the super space where we're seeing sort of starting to see more overlap and, and there's, there's more interest for common, um, common solutions, I guess, between that and right. what we see in the, in the X-Plan world. Yeah, and I guess that was going to be one of my questions actually focusing on the global users, but let's go to, you know, let's focus on that there. I'm I'm betting that there is lessons from one you apply to the other, you know, something that you get asked for in advice or verse, vice versa in managed funds world and you think, wait a minute, we could, we could enhance X plan somehow by the lessons we're learning over there. So is there sort of that cross pollination of ideas or feedback? Yeah, yeah, there is definitely. And sort of, you know, you mentioned there what we see globally. So there's there's definitely great ideas that come out of different regions. Mm. Um, we look at things like case manager in X plan, which is used globally now as sort of that um, um, simple way of sort of keeping and collating electronic artifacts related to a piece of advice using yep. using the case concept. Um, that that came out of South Africa a number of years ago and has gradually okay. evolved and grown and is now used globally. So we do see that. We see um, you know, different ideas coming out of different regions. And you're right in terms of what we see here from um, managed funds administration and also superannuation. So um, looking at what you know advice businesses in those uh, in those segments do and how that applies and is relevant for other parts of the business. Even some recent projects we were looking at, um, you know, in the managed fund space, looking at um, digital account opening and, and onboarding right. for clients to so invest directly into managed funds. We were sort of looking at those capabilities and what we need to do um, in terms of whether it's account opening through to a platform or through to another product or a super fund. Yeah. There's obviously, you know, it's a pretty similar set of information you need to capture a pretty similar experience and, and integrations you need there to be able to open an account, whatever that might be. So we're definitely seeing more and more um, reuse and the ability to build things once and leverage those capabilities across different um, different segments. Yes, yeah, certainly. Now that you mention it with the account opening, certainly um, we used to hold a mortgage license. And so interestingly in the mortgage broking world, they got a lot further down the path of sort of one way to enter data to say apply to multiple different banks. So, you know, like the inter- integration between us and the product providers, they like, to be honest, it felt further ahead in the sense that there was sort of a funnel you could go through. It wasn't you doing it individually with each and you didn't have yeah. to do them manually, you know. And so I've always wondered when we were going to get to that point where, you know, it could be easier to, um, you know, account opening or interaction because 
for me, you know, right now, in fact, part of the most manual part of what we do is the follow-up interaction and submission to product providers. Like it's, yeah, it's hard work yeah. right now, right? Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, definitely. And I, and I think we were probably even slightly further ahead in, in, in the advice industry than they were in marketers go back 20 years. But um, we haven't kept up and haven't kept improving on those. Yeah. So it still feels like what we're doing now is not that far different to what we were doing 20 years ago, even though there have been, there have been integrations, there have been capabilities to, to open accounts and things. But I think there's there's a lot more interest in that at, at the moment. Um, so we're doing a lot of work, speaking to lots of people and and, and building some some new solutions in that space that will, will help with things like account opening, um, whether it's direct to consumer in terms of being able to go all the way through from a public sure. website through a piece of advice themselves and actually open an account or whether it's with an advisor involved and, and facilitating um, facilitating that, that process. And even some recent conversations, again, sort of popping up in the in the insurance space and looking at how we could, you know, what opportunities there are there to streamline or come together to make those processes more efficient. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess in terms of the volume of data that has to get handed over, the insurance, it's much higher <laughs> and more similar to mortgages, I guess, where it's like, like it's a yeah. lot that goes into the application. So, you know, that would make a massive difference. Yeah, it is. And then lots, lots of specific questions, which I think is the sort of where that tends to has run into issues over the years, the, yeah. the need for those specific questions for, for underwriting. Mm, absolutely. And I feel like, like as you've been running through all the elements, I feel like maybe I should have asked, what are the things you guys don't do? Like, is there a part of advice tech that you've intentionally steered clear yeah, of or that um, you've uh, you know, yeah, not no, focused on? No, but I've, I've actually been using that example recently into, as we've been sort of talking a bit more about the, this sort of account opening end of the process where I think we do really well sort of end-to-end. -end. So right from initial onboarding of a client, you know, it could be from a form on a public website, right through data capture, um, initial exploration tools, um, you know, via your client via client portal, everything the advisor and advice business needs in terms of capturing data and, and coming up with your strategy and product recommendations, getting them into a document, um, presenting that to the client, making that available to the client and coming up with your portfolio recommendations, feeding into that as well. So I think we do really well up to that point and you get to the point where the client says, yes, I want to go ahead. And then it, it feels like it's 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 often a sort of switch off to other systems, hopefully yeah. not paper too much these days. But I think that's the piece where there's bigger opportunity now. Um, and we're seeing that that more of the the product issuers so on the on the other side they're more willing have better systems better APIs now than they did in years gone by so okay. those integration pro projects feel much more achievable now than they have have in the past and it's not just necessarily at initial account opening but what if you wanted to update a detail about a client or change a product or a switch or something like that could you right. sort of actually push those through from from our systems through to, to product systems as well yeah, and the, I mean, the, what I would call simple interfaces with a product, I mean, updating some basic details or even a switch, you know, once something's in place, um, they are relatively simple. But for many of the platforms, they're, I, don't, I guess, maybe encumbered by a combination of their systems and the old way they've done it, maybe old forms and all sorts of things, it can be so clunky. So surely for them, there's some benefit there too, you know, where if, if we can just get this a bit smoother, it's going to make a difference. I think um, I, got, I was lucky enough to go in into town and get to meet with some executive who were talking about the, the future of a platform. And one of the things I asked them was, please, 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 when you're looking at your development plan from a tech perspective, just seriously consider whether there's some jumps you should be making, whether there's some things that are still on your development path that actually have almost got old. They've been on there for so long, <laughs> we should skip them entirely. You know, like, I mean, they were super, still super excited about digital digital signatures. And I'm thinking, oh, I feel like there's a, a yeah. leap we could make, you know, what? like, like you'll still be doing that in two years. Maybe we, we could we could skip that and go even further, you know, and maybe even more secure um, than signatures at all, you know. So I'm hoping that there's more of that because that's clearly going to make, you know, for you, for you guys, that's going to make it easier too if they're all just starting to be a bit more proactive about the way they can interact with tools. Geez, it's going to make a difference. 
Yeah, well, definitely, and they're the sort of conversations we're having having at the moment. That and, and I think there is sort of big big opportunity there. It's a, sort of the approach we've been taking a bit in the last couple of years. If you look at sort of what we've done around advice fee consent, and even the work on on DDO as well, where we've tried to sort of build that connectivity. So between in between X Plan and and the various the various product issuers, whether it's getting data in like TMDs in from product issuers and making them available to to users in in our software, or whether it's getting information back out and whether it's reporting something. Or passing a form through, building that connectivity so that so that all of these things start to become a bit easier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So then, you know, I mean, in terms of the use, users of the tool, it's it's so broad. So it's it's not just the advisors, it's support teams, it's the licensee, um, you know, practice managers, all sorts, so it's across the board. Do you ever sort of, is there ever a point where it becomes a bit of a struggle to manage the conflicting demands of that, you know, so it's because it's trying to be a whole lot of things to a whole lot of people, is that something that's, that's, or do you leave that to the user end to sort of define how that sort of works, that tension? Uh, yeah, and I guess, I guess users will always decide how they're going to how they're going to use it, and everyone comes <laughs> up with their own ways in some cases. But we do spend a lot of time thinking about different personas. So, what are the different types of roles within the ver- the different types of businesses that use our software? Yeah. And, and they can be quite different. It could be a phone based advice team just offering intra fund advice, or it could be a team that a business that's more focused on investment management and running, managing portfolios. So, there are quite a, a range of different personas. We've we've got a bunch of them mapped out, so we know the ve- the various different types of users, and we think about who's relevant for you know work in a particular area, and think about right. the sort of things they try and do. So yeah, it is it is it is broad. There's a whole range of different types of of users, as you said. There's the sort of the the everyday users who are in there all the time, and then there's you know people that you know could be at licensees like compliance functions that aren't in there all yeah. the time, but need to get in and access information at different times. So yeah, it it is it is broad um, but all of the teams and different teams think about the different types of users that are sort of most relevant to them. Yeah, fair enough um, and tweak accordingly. Um, do you feel that though perhaps like and you guys would really see this across so many types of practices that perhaps there's some under training with different roles like uh, like advisors, I'm, I'm betting let's put advisors and slash power planners in a category where they probably deep dive into something like X plan because they're in it all the time, right? And so it, that always means that you you learn quickly, even if you maybe build some bad habits with a tool, but <laughs> still you do learn rel- relatively quickly. But do you think there's potentially, you know, for listeners that maybe there's some more training they could do for other members of the team to really take advantage of all that they can get in something like x yeah, yeah, definitely. I'd encourage people to sort of keep an eye out on the community for, for you know, training that's available. And, and, you know, if you haven't had any training for a few years, um, you know, whether it's, web, you know, webinar type training or, or looking for upcoming courses, you know, get get involved and, and have a look at what's there. The community is a good source of information as well. Lots of, okay. you know, release information and videos and, and how-to guides. Um, and, and, you know, in, in many cases, some of those how-to guides are, are written based on our interactions with, with advisors and power planners who do use the software a lot, but yeah. they Coming up against you know particularly complex scenarios, you know multi-entity strategies they're trying to model in calm or whatever it might be, where they're not sure how to do something, and and the team will, will take it back, come up with a case study, and you know, put it on the community so people could see and sort of start to open up the, the different you know, um, you know different ways that the system can be used. And I think that's um, that's always the case with a complex tool. I'd put sort of advanced users of Excel in a similar category where often, you know, the inmates end up running the asylum because they're the ones that are trying to stretch the thing and use it for all sorts of different scenarios. You guys simply can't do that because you aren't interacting with the end user as much, you know, and not the volume. So um, it's with the clients as much anyway. So so it's yeah. always going to be your users that are going to be the source of that, aren't they? Because it's it's where the, the really unusual combination of some strange strategy that then needs to get replicated yeah Um, yeah so i guess you know for the listener you know it's so important to give feedback to ask that question to you know the team to the iris team so that you know that community can build you know and all of that knowledge can can sort of get laid on top of each other um and we can all sort of get better at using something like uh explain because this is not the sort of tool you need to do in isolation i don't think you know i don't (laughs) it's there's so much to it i think the more you can reach out to fellow users i think the better off you'll be um in in taking advantage of everything that's there 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that that's and that's why we've got the, the, the community there and sort of encourage everyone to get involved there and people share ideas and answer each other's questions and, and get involved and share and learn and we, we learn a lot from them as well. Perfect, perfect. We'll make sure to um, include details about the community in the show notes, folks, so that you can reach out if you aren't already part of that. Is there, you know, looking across the business you do deal with, and I recognising that the tool is built to try and do as much as it can for lots of different types um, of practices, are there any that it works particularly well for or conversely it just doesn't work for? Do you, is there a pattern that you find on either case? Uh, no, no, I don't, I don't think so. I've just said it's, it's pretty, pretty flexible and scalable. So uh, then we have, we have businesses across the, you know, the, the full range of sizes, literally from one to, to several thousand, um, users and, and yep. they, it, it scales, they configure it differently. They'll, they'll use it differently. Um, but the, the range of capabilities there, um, can be adapted to suit different different business different, yeah. different business sizes, different business types, different you know offering different advice channels, different you know scaled advice, phone based advice, complex advice, diff- different channels, different types of, of of advice and complexity. Yeah, and I think I think ultimately, I mean the user experience. When I say that, I mean the client experience um, has not necessarily been in financial advice generally has not necessarily been the window we look through when we look at even our offerings, you know, let alone the tech we use. Like it's always, it hasn't necessarily been that because it's all complicated and we need all these tools. And so I think over time I can see, um, for example, the uncoupling from a licensee templating, pushing down to advisors to a more, well, what's the user, you know, the client experience you want? What does that mean you need a tool like X plan to do? You know, so I think I can see that happening over time where they'll, therefore, like you say, it'll be defined by what their offering is like, what the experience is like. Therefore, what does the tool need to do? What do the workflows need to do? You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, Yeah. As opposed to a sort of a, uh, you know, off the shelf just start using this, um, you know, from say maybe a defined, licensee defined sort of version of the system. Are you seeing less of those, the sort of, you know, the reboxed licensee versions of, of the tool? Um, yeah, pro- probably slightly, yes. I guess there's, at the same time, we, we're also sort of trying to build a more more standard content as well, standard content and configuration because, you know, we, you, we don't sense. want all of our clients to, ha- to have to build everything from scratch. So yeah. um, I, I think we're sort of lo- looking to sort of help help our clients get up and running um up and running faster and not spend time on, on configuration, not we want everything to be standardized and cookie cutter yeah. for everyone. Um, um, let you personalize it to the extent you want. And obviously you then control how you, you know, the, the aspects that present out to clients, whether it's client portal, whether it's engagement tools you'll use in meetings, um, that side of it's really important to personalize and, and sort of fit in with your your business and how you want to present to clients. Um, but we can sort of help in, in streamlining a lot of the rest of it behind the scenes. Yeah, okay. Now, you mentioned the client portal there. You know, that's um, – it's the thing, isn't it? It's the, it's the new black uh, client portals, um, understandably. Um, even just from – so the two things for me about client portals being one channel for the client to us, um, phone, email, SMS, like there's just so many. If we can actually get to the point where we're interacting with clients through one primary place, I think that will be so powerful. But also from just a cyber security perspective, I think the the reality of that, the client portals to me fit that beautifully. What, yeah, so I, I know you guys have one, but I don't know a great deal about, about it. So can you tell us about where it's at now and maybe where it's going from a portal perspective? Yeah, so our, our our client portal, the latest iteration of client portal, has been out for a, for a few years now. Mm. It's a it's a as you've suggested there, it's a it's a secure information portal where clients can log in and and view their view their portfolios, view view things like balance sheet and documents, and share communications with with their advisor. It's configurable, so you control which which of those things are made available to your clients potentially, and potentially are made available at different times or different stages in the in the client. Um, client relationship um, so highly secure great for communication so you're not sending things um, via email it's obviously yeah. always on people can access their info um, 24 7 and, and communicate with their advisor when when they when they want to 
Um, so it's really great from a from an engagement perspective, also from a transparency perspective as well, and sort of building trust. The client giving the client access to their information, so they sort of feel like they're always, you know, to some extent in control and have visibility over over their 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 financial situation, and and can start sort of building and you know tracking goals and those sorts of things. Yeah. So there's those capabilities. There's digital signature capability. There's okay. things like fact find as well. Um, um, that's one area we probably sort of you know we'd like to see more usage. If I think of client portal. We sort of count probably in the hundreds of thousands of logins a month. If we think of how much fact finds are used, it's in the hundreds. It's probably many hundreds now a month in terms of um, wow. clients that will go through a through an onboarding fact find journey. Okay. Um, um, but we'd like to see we'd like to see more and more of that, and that, that has been growing in um, in recent months. Um, yeah. Okay. There. So is part of that the fact that potentially um, you know we've we've all got our process or the way we do things and advisors potentially have a tool, they may even have turned it on, um, but aren't necessarily adjusting their whole process to take advantage of it. So it's a maybe a nice to have instead of making it sort of a fundamental core part of the experience. Do you think that's possibly what's happening with the portals? Uh, yeah, yeah, it probably is to to some extent, and especially with something like a, um, you know, if you're, if you're providing access to clients for information, that that's relatively easy and get them set up. They can log in and they can log in sort of as and when they want. But where you want them to engage in a process a, a bit more, obviously that mm-hmm. requires change in in the process and workflows within your business to build it in and make it an important part of that of that process. So there's a bit yeah. a bit more work to do in terms of building it into your process and and sort of promoting and getting clients to actually use it. But I I think that it's anything you can get the client to do in the advice process. I think is really useful in terms of building engagement in, into um, into advice, and you know whether you're getting them to do a fact find as, as short or long as you want to make that. Whether you're getting them to explore goals or access some educational content, whatever they do, it, when you meet with the client, they've they've either made the process more efficient because they've provided some information you don't have to ask them when you're sitting mm. down together. And and or they've they're more engaged in the process. They've come in. They've started thinking about the sort of things you've asked about, but also potentially started thinking about goals and what might be important to them. So hopefully they come into the process more more engaged and have made the whole thing more efficient. Yeah, and I think um, I mean we all think about say something like video being oh you know it's great and everybody says it's a way to connect with the consumer and it's one it's fabulous because you know multiple people you can send the same video to multiple people but what I think gets missed is that the brain assimilates say a short little video from an advisor that might even be pre-positioning the fact find like a little video hey this is what this is about well, well, well it'd be great if you could fill this out before we meet um, that's also time that's trust time because the brain sees that as you sitting in front of them. It, it I can't tell the difference. So, you know, you're really banking some time well before they even get to the live meeting. So I agree with you there. I think we're probably not taking advantage of enough of that. But I think there's some wariness about automation, isn't there? There's certainly some wariness about making it callous or cold or, you know, my clients want to be personalized. So I, I guess yeah. that's we've got to combat that a little bit. Um, I think that's yeah. a lack of creativity. I think we just need to get a bit more creative, a bit more personal show a bit more of our own personality when we do it perhaps. Um, yeah, so agree. That, yep. Yeah, and, so and, that then it does that, feel like a personal message. Yeah, and I, and I don't think you, yeah, you don't want to give the client a here's a fact find that's 20 pages long without any yeah. positioning or context about what you're doing and expect yeah. them to go through it. I think that was one of the recent additions. This came out of a design sprint we did um, a little while ago in terms of looking at how to improve um, a review version of a fact find. So what do you right. want clients to do coming into a meeting? And one of the things that came out of that that we added was the ability to embed a video on the first page. So your client gets a notification jumps into the portal and has a look and see and the first thing they see is a video of you explaining why it's important they go through these next these next few steps so it's a great example you've given there and something that we found as being as being sort of important in positioning um and you can it's because i know i've spoken to everyone like yeah but peter then the advisors are seeing the same video they don't need to once a year do a new one in a different location yeah. and change the template <laughs> and just put the new video in it and the client will see a new video. Like you're not yep. getting them to do the fact find 12 times a year. So, you know, just schedule this stuff. I I completely get keeping it fresh. I, I completely agree with that. But um, just schedule it and it'll all roll out and they'll go, wow, you know, it's another video from you. So, that, so yeah. it's clearly that is one of the things that's sort of being underutilized or or sort of not um, fully expanded on. So listeners, I'd really encourage you to sort of check that out. In terms of 
potentially new users, um, is there anything, you know, a practice might be considering moving across, is there anything you'd suggest they perhaps do before or that prepares them well? Like, is there anything you see that you go, oh, like it slows people down in transition or makes it particularly difficult? Um, I think with any software, um, it's only going to be as useful as the the data that you put into yes. it. So, whatever you're whatever you're implementing, um, I, I think that the uh, it's important to to get your data sorted, get it in shape, get ready for sort of data to be migrated in. Um, and then, and there's there's tools that will help with that. You know, data feeds will help in terms of populating a lot of data. You know, platform and insurance data feeds will, will help with that. And even beyond that, it can take time to get your data sorted, but right. it will it will set you up and 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 you'll be ready then that wherever you see value, wherever you think you might want to go once once you're up and running, whether it's you know working on your workflows or reports or enabling client portal or even something like advice fee consent, um, whatever you want to do, you'll you'll be ready if your if your data is in if your client data is in is in good shape it's probably yeah. probably the first one the other one i think is sort of have a have a clear clear idea and spend some time thinking about what you want software to to deliver um, yeah. both in, in sort of you know in, in considering what software you're going you're going to use but also then how you're going to implement it um, don't jump straight into to a shiny tool without thinking about how it fits into your processes, how it's going to work with other things that you use, um, what problems you're trying to solve with it really, uh, and how it's going to fit in and, and be adopted. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with you. I think, you know, particularly tools like this, this is not a, you know, one thing where you're slotting it into maybe even one step of your process. Like it's unusual that that'd be the case. I would have thought for X plan say, but um, yeah. it's going to, it's going to hit multiple steps, multiple processes. Um, so you, you really do need to give some thought to that and you're right, some time for that to sort of embed um, and get the team used to. Now, speaking of integrations, I'm, I'm betting there's all sorts of integrations. A simple one I saw was, say, with Outlook. Does it integrate with um, Gmail as well, with G Suite? Um, there is some integration. There's, there's more work going on that one that one cool. at the moment. So, yep. yeah, that's actually it's actually being handled by, by one of our teams overseas. So I'd have to actually check on progress on that one. Um, yep. That's one one of our benefits of a global company. We have different teams in different places with different specialisations that are looking at looking at uh, looking at different areas. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah, um, but sort of you know, looking more broadly, integrations there there are there are hundreds. Um, there's information again on community as well. There about the various different integration types that are available. But there are, yeah. you know, if you look at, um, you know, we've got integrations with um, you know, engagement tools, marketing tools, fact finds and portals, um, yeah. document management, scanning integrations, you know, cash flow okay. budgeting, PFM type tools. There's a whole range of different systems where we have have integrations that can be enabled by by our clients and then there's sort of deeper integrations things like we talked about irisnet for data feeds there's trading integrations dress lookups and those sort of things that are more you know um, baked into into the into the software Deep integrations so, as opposed yeah, to yeah, no, there, yeah there are and you know, there are literally hundreds of these of these um of these integrations um and and and, uh, and then hundreds more that clients have have built themselves um for their own you know specific purposes yeah. Okay. And so in terms of then, you know, your current users, and there's quite a number of those, um, is there any features, you know, maybe, you know, the development team have worked super hard on some things that they think are awesome that you just find people are underutilized and there's a great opportunity. Are there any areas that you feel you'd sort of point people to, to go, Hey, check that out. Cause there's some really great value there. Um, yeah, so one I'd probably call out at the moment is the um, visualize functionality. So this is um, building on um, Xtools or Xtools Plus. So yep. lo lots of our lots of our um, users would use Calm um, to do yep. to do their modeling. So you know, detailed cash flow modeling tool. Mm -hmm. um, Calm's been around for a long time. Mm. Um, what we've built in recent in recent times has been a, a, a visualization tool that sort of sits over the top of that. So it lets you present um, scenarios and interact them real interact with them real time while sitting with clients. Um, yep. So instead of just you know, getting some charts and tables from Calm and merging them into your advice document, you can actually bring it up on screen and present it real time. So some new screens that have some new visuals, um, access to things like strategy levers and um, what if um, tools, the ability to interact with goals, so add more goals, vary goals for clients not on track to actually actually um, actually meeting all their goals, do things like run Monte Carlo simulation and present um, present the outputs of that as well. And then uh, and coming out reasonably soon is the ability to 
compare scenarios as well. So all the okay. things you'd want to do in presenting the outputs of that modeling and, and you know, compare scenarios and, and look at the, the benefits and the value of advice to your clients and how it helps them achieve their objectives, be able to sort of present that and interact real time. So okay, um, with that one, look for the visualize button. Open a calm scenario, look in the top right-hand corner of the screen for the visualize button, give it a click, have a look and see, look at um, look at what you can do in there at the moment. And again, keep an eye out in the community for um, for more information on how to use it and what's, what's available today. But I'd also say keep checking back in the coming months as well. So um, this is... This is an example of probably one of our newer bits of tech that's built a different way and where it, it's, it lets us move more quickly, I think, in okay. terms of adding, adding features. So keep an yeah. eye on it. It will grow Bit more largely nimble. based on feedback for what people are yeah. looking about and what they want okay. to use in, in client meetings. And look, I'd say too, when you're doing these visualised sort of exercises, um, we need to start looking to the world outside of finance to see how they you know, treat data and how they sort of present it to people because, um, look, all of us love XY graphs, but <laughs> lots of consumers have no idea what that is or what it says. So I think over time, as as we all, you know, get a bit more creative and, and a bit more confident with these things, we can start to actually get really clever with the way we represent some things so that it's just like the, the impact of the message um, can be so significant and so quick for a client then, you know, so give the feedback, send it back to the team, to the, to the IRS team and say, Hey, I saw this great thing. Could we do something like this in visualize for that particular bit of data? You know, so, cause they're only, they can't think of all those things, right? So keep your eyes peeled. And if you see something great, I mean, some, you know, magazines like Time Magazine and these other places often have these data houses where they're trying to, you know, use population data and show it to us all differently. Start watching that stuff, you know, and let's see what we can come up with. Cause um, yeah, that's yeah, where the was- magic is, I think. It, it is, and we've got there's there's an infographic page in there at the moment, which has got some limited infographics, um, sort of you know images supplemented with the values from the projections. Um, but we want to do more in that space again to help those clients who who don't who glaze over when they see a, a line chart. Um, how can we present the information in different ways that that's more engaging to them? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's exciting. Now you mentioned case manager. And that brings up an interesting point. Um, there's a lot of historical, in terms of the way we either store or or curate the information we have on clients or the process, um, you know, a lot of people might have a folder, you know, a, 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 a cloud technology folder with the client's information in it and they might have, oh, well, SOAs go in here, fact finds go in here. Like that's not an unusual structure, right? And the challenge with that is it's very hard to find and find things. I'm betting what the case manager idea is, is that, you know, this is a an activity. It's a grouped activity that occurred in this time frame. say it's a review or whatever. Everything for that sits under that case. Is that correct? Am I interpreting that correctly? It is. Yes, yeah, 100%. Okay. So, you sort of, you can you can link the workflows um, to it so it sort of can drive the process of the things you need to do. But then everything, all of the, all of the electronic artifacts that, that are generated as you move through that process. So, it could be a diary appointment, a fact find, a file note, a, um, an external scenario, yep. a, an email, all of those different um, different electronic records can be linked to the case. They all obviously exist still out where they would normally would in terms of, you know, doc notes and scenario lists and things. So you can still find yeah. them where you normally would, but you can go into one spot and all of those linked records are available there. So you can get that sort of picture of everything that's happened about a particular case. That's right. Perfect. Perfect. And I mean, that's a wonderful for handover. You know, when you've got multiple tech people touching something, um, that sort of grouping is so powerful. Um, so, yeah, you know, I love that. I was, I was unaware of that myself. Um, is there any other sort of ninja stuff that you'd get people to look out for or anything else that, you know, they're not using well? Um, no, I, I think that the, probably the, the most important ones would be client portal and the, and the visualize, okay. the visualize item, I'd say, and take, take a look at, at both of those, um, yep. as sort of the, the first priorities. Um, yep. and then, yeah, keep an eye out community for the next, the next most interesting things that are, that are coming out. <laughs> Perfect. And so then, you know, let's look forward, you know, what is, what's on the radar, what are you guys taking a look at as sort of the next iterations or the next things you might uh, fold in uh, yeah. to the tools? Yeah, I think so. The, there's a there's a few there's a few big ones. Um, the 
there's a big focus at the moment sort of working through um, workflow and task management. So yep. um, that one, we've did a, a big research piece last year, lots of design work, and we're now building out the first uh, the first stages of a rethink of how we deal with sort of task management. So that that's a really important one, that, and yep. then moving on, starting soon on, on document management as well. Both of those are some of the highest use areas of the system. Yep. They're, they're used, you know, literally millions of times a month. So they... <laughs> Lots of users spend lots of time in those screens, and there's big opportunities to improve um, improve user experience and and efficiency um, as we work through those. So um, that that they're sort of a big focus. Beyond that, there's a few things. Advice fee consent. I think that's probably one where the industry is looking to try and solve solve it better. Um, we're, we're working with the industry, working with the FSC and, and lots of platforms in terms of what a, a more standardised solution could look like, um, yeah. both in terms of you know, making it, a, we can make it a more automated solution, but also simplify implementation as well by not yeah. having to deal with lots of different forms and all that, that complexity. Yes. Um, and, and we'll see what comes out of the um, quality advice review process that might change that going forward. Um, yep. that, that will be interesting. Certainly. Yeah. Is there anything Anything further out, anything that you sort of you're, you're curious about of where it could take, you know, advice tech or, or what, you know, what advisors might be able to do, anything that's, you know, VR, any of those sort of things that are further out that you're, you're interested in that clearly aren't yeah. on the development path as much as you're just keeping an eye on? Yeah, we we do um, we do try and spend time thinking about thinking about those things. You mentioned Hackathon earlier. That's mm-hmm. a great example where where developers and and all of our teams that get involved in Hackathon now can think about what they might want to build or play around with. And we always get out of, out of Hackathons. We also we always get some some really good ideas that are really close and and things that you know people need now and literally end up within the product within weeks after right. a, after a hackathon yeah. um, and then there's always a few ideas that are a good year or two out and aren't going to work and that don't necessarily work on the day but are great attempts at looking at how you know whether it's voice interaction or or ai and those sort of things where we always learn a lot from those that it might not come into the product as quickly but it sort of sets us down the path of, of investigating exploring different things that that might be interesting um, yeah okay and another one is is probably the sort of what we're learning from our cloud migration over the last couple of years. So yep. um, we, we've moved we've moved almost all of our, our services to the cloud now, and there's there's huge benefits as delivered already in terms of scalability, security, and even things like automated upgrades. So right. you know, if you look back, it wasn't that long ago that we were, had lots of different versions of our software in use by different clients and all these Oof. manual upgrade processes. Whereas now almost all all of our of our clients are on weekly auto upgrades. They're, yeah. they're much faster upgrades, and it means that new features are available and in clients' hands. You know, within a, a week or two of, of them being released. So yeah, when I said fantastic. before about um, cash flow visualized and saying keep check on it regularly, we know now that if we add in, you know, if we add in compare scenarios in a few weeks' time, we know that there'll be the vast majority of users will be able to access that within a week, not you know, what, what might have been several months in the past. So yeah, okay. there's, there's all the benefits there we've already we've already seen, but there's also, it's opened up different opportunities. So there's, there's different capabilities that are available in some of these cloud services that mean that we can do things that either we hadn't thought of in the past or we'd thought of, but just weren't physically possible before. So things like Monte Carlo simulation in Calm, yeah. we could have done it before, but it would have been really slow and users would have been annoyed. Um, <laughs> so there's things like that that we can open up that are now possible and, and you know, whether it's things like that in terms of processing power, whether it's, um, you know, looking into documents and being able to search within text within documents and then ultimately being able to to read from those documents and, and um, get structured data out of unstructured data, all those sort yeah. of things that are starting to become not quite plug and play, but their their capabilities that are much yeah. more much more available to us to, to start to incorporate um, over time. That's exciting. And I think it must also be exciting for your teams because, I mean, in the old environment, you know, work, 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 release, and even feedback would be like six months later, you'd be getting feedback rather than sort of any yeah. instant feedback. So it must be better for your development teams as well because, you know, they can instantly get some feedback and, and start to tweak and adjust. Um, so it must, you know, we all like sort of instant, you know, recognition or response. So it must um, sort of, you know, uh, rev them up a bit more, I'd imagine, on the work they do. 
It uh, it does definitely, and you're 100 percent right about getting the feedback sooner. But you know, just after they've finished working on something, not 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 many months later, so that that is really important. Um, and and being able to see that you know you know looking at usage analytics and seeing that people are using things within days of them being released is that's that's really exciting and and um, yeah, really exciting for for all of our all of our teams. Perfect. Is there anything else that we've missed? Anything we haven't covered? I mean, we didn't particularly deep dive into the individual sort of tools, but I think that comes down to each of you know the listener and what they um, access. It sounds like the Iris or the XPen community would be a good idea to really sort of spend some time in and and you know interact and absorb. Um, but is there anything else that we should cover off on? Do you think? Um, no, I think as you said, we could spend we could spend hours going through in the, the detail <laughs> yeah. and and talk in detail about you know individual modules probably, but um, um, it's probably probably too much to go go into today. So yeah, keep an eye on community, ask questions there, um, and then um, yeah, look for more information. Perfect. Look, all right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Iris and X-Plan, then, you know, we'll have all sorts of links in the episode show notes, along with Matt's LinkedIn details. So feel free to, you know, ping him for your ideas too. Maybe not. There's probably a formal way to give feedback um, that's the appropriate way. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us, Matt. I'm really looking forward to witnessing where Iris goes. I think you've probably been lumbered with a bit of a, a slow elephant view from the market for a while, which is unfair. Um, it was very big, but I can, well, I mean, everything you're describing today is so exciting and, you know, the excitement for your team, but also for the users to be, you know, this shifting and changing and so much work going on. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with. Um, I think we're all going to have to run to keep up, it sounds like. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to catch up and and it is definitely exciting times ahead and, and yeah, lot, lots of new stuff coming out um, in the coming months. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, are you a current user of X-Plan and all the tools Iris has? Do you agree or disagree of our discussion of the suite of uh, apps that um, Iris supplies? Look, please share your insights on the XY community platform. As I know, there are people on there who would love to hear your take. And please, 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 pretty please <laughs> share any tips you have with other advisors on using and really taking advantage um, of XPlan and all of those tools. Now, in terms of sort of my thoughts for you, you know, if you are a current user of XPlan, I'd definitely encourage you to really take the time to understand all the functionality that you have available to you. You know, maybe schedule some time that's not when you're in and out of it for client work, but almost offsite almost and do some digging. Um, you know, invariably we get so focused on the tools we've learned and the ones we use a lot we often then ignore what else is available. You know, refresh your training. Just because you're going to know a whole lot of the things that you go through doesn't mean you weren't learned something that can just elevate the way you're using the tool. And look, perhaps send, you know, a newer member of the team on some training or to watch some videos or to take part, you know, and then get them to come back and update the whole group, um, the, all the users in your team on what they discovered and what they think um, you could be maybe changed in the practice of how you use the tool. So definitely do that. I absolutely, I'm with Matt here, you know, check out the visualized tool and start to suggest different things of ways that data can be represented, ways you can, you know, utilize the data to present a thought or a concept to clients. The more we do that, the better we all are. And secondly, if you're, if you are using a sort of really core and quite thorough, you know, advice tool like XPlan, but you just find another tool that does something really narrow and specific really well. And it really suits either your offering or the way you do things. That happens, right? We come across something like, oh, that sounds really great. But then when you do some digging, maybe it doesn't integrate fully with XPlan. Now, what often happens is that we then start to either doubt the, the core tool we have, maybe an X-Plan or the one we're looking at. And I'd get you to take a breath in that instance, because when I see something like that, we've got a core tool and I see this other thing that does this, you know, narrow thing really well, then I always consider whether we can actually take advantage of a different type of API or integration, something I call human API for these situations, which is just my name for humans taking data from one source and entering it into the other. Now, people think this is clunky, clunky, but, you know, particularly if this can be done by a support team member or a VA, 
then this could mean that you can use the tool you've got, but then you have access to a great resource and you aren't pained by the double data entry. You can check it when you you use the tool, but you aren't pained by it. You know, and the thing is, you know, often down the track, the tools will actually be integrated, right? If it's really popular, then businesses like Iris, they see that, you know, and they're going to start to consider the integrations down the track. Um, but the thing that I always look for is if using human API and the use case works, then of course, down the track when transfer of data is possible and the use case looks even better. So please just don't discount a tool that you come across that's this narrow, specific, wonderful thing. Um, and also don't doubt the tool you're using just because you've discovered that other thing. Think about how you could use them alongside each other. Consider human API as, a, as an option and see how you go. Uh, we actually made this decision on, a, on one particular piece of software and we found that this niche tool had such a positive impact on our effectiveness it more than makes up for the little bit of data re-entry required. In fact, I'd say by a multiple of 10, it makes up for it. So it was well worth us making things, you know, a little bit hard with the data entry, but the impact aside from that is massive. Now, if you've been following along um, for the ride on, on our Advice Tech Pod, you know that one of my missions is to help you build your curiosity muscle, which is a core requirement for advice explorers and bionic advisors alike. Today's Curiosity Corner app that caught my eye is called Notion. You can find it at notion.com. This is a tool that sort of connects your teams, projects, and project documents. Um, and it sort of has the feel of, I guess, a wiki. Um, it has the organizational capability of a database and sort of the note taking and data archiving ability of a networked notepad. Um, in the digging I've done, it's one of those tools that once you understand it, you know, it's really powerful. It's super easy to set up, but people do sometimes have a bit of a challenge getting their sort of heads and arms around the thing. You know, it, it can be a bit hard to grasp initially. You know, this is one of those tools that regular users love, but it can take some time to get your head around. Um, so this is the sort of thing you, you might have your how-tos, you might have all your internal processes, you might have your meeting notes, team meeting notes in. So this is less client-facing, more internal projects, you know, that sort of thing. So it's something to consider. There's a lot of alternatives we'll flag on the pod down the track, but I did want to just mention it. Also, I did want to flag something as a bit of a learning exercise because this will give us a good learning exercise for new apps that we consider. The company clearly owns Notion.com, so that's the website they tell you to go to. But what's interesting is when you enter that into your browser, you're redirected to Notion.so. Now, what's interesting about that is .so is actually a Somalian extension. Now, granted, them using .so is merely sort of a vanity top-level domain, right? It's just a, it's a top-level thing. Even so, the fact that it's an unexpected web address of where you end up for a region that Somalia, that our, our government currently has a, you know, a no-travel warning on it due to armed conflict and high threat of terrorist attack and kidnapping probably means you should run the app past your resident cyber expert to be on the safe side. So I did some digging, right? Now, the fact is Notion is located in San Francisco and it looks like all of its data is on Amazon Web Services. So that's an initial, okay, yeah, it sounds better. Um, and it turns out when they launched the app, someone else already owned the website or the web um, domain Notion.com. But, you know, the optics of that .so associa association could still be problematic. So it's worth, this is the sort of thing you'd check with your licensee. Um, and I believe it's another example of where we simply need to ask more questions of the technology we use in all facets of our daily lives. Dig further, notice where a link sends you, notice the details of the domain, and let's just start getting, you know, keeping our eyes open for these sorts of things. Well, whew, that was a bit of a long one, folks, um, but that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And if you'd like a speaker at your next event to brief your audience on the seven habits of bionic advisors and the secrets to tech-powered human-centric advice, then please reach out to me on LinkedIn forward slash Peter MD. That's P-E-I-T-A-M-D. 
Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. (laughs) 